So the beginning of what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who, per who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray as we have a look at this passage tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, when Jesus was tempted... Uh, he knew that we don't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we pray tonight that we'd remember that, and we pray and thank you that you are speaking to us through your word, through the word of your Son tonight. And we ask that you'd feed us. We ask that you'd help us see more what it means to be your disciples, to live in your kingdom. And we pray this for your glory. Amen. I'm so blessed because... I wonder what you would put to fill in the blank. I'm so blessed because I've got my health. I'm so blessed because I've got work at this time. I'm so blessed because I had a good holiday. I'm so blessed because the kids and grandkids are all happy at the moment. What is it that you say when you talk about being blessed, if you do talk in that way? Or what is it you hear others say? Well, that's what Jesus is saying in these Beatitudes, in this overture, in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking about blessing, isn't he? Is this what he says? Blessed are the healthy. Blessed are the wealthy, blessed are the happy, blessed are those who've got it all together, blessed are those for whom life is going well. Well, no, that's not what Jesus is saying, is he? As we look at how he defines the blessed life. And it is countercultural to perhaps how often we think of a blessed life. So let's take a look at what Jesus says about living in his kingdom. I've uh, rephrased point two to that, which is indeed a countercultural kingdom. But we see here in these Beatitudes, as they're known, what it's like to live in Jesus' kingdom. But before we take a look at this passage in Matthew 5, I thought it would be helpful just to remind ourselves of the context of where we are. In Matthew chapter 2, we saw that a new king was on the scene, a baby, Jesus, who was born king of the Jews, God's king. And we'll do one of two things in response to that, either like Herod or the wise men. We'll either bow down before him and worship him like the Magi, or we will, in some way like Herod, seek to wage war on God's king who has come. And then we saw how John the Baptist was preparing the way for God's king and how he was proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Which is what had happened in Jesus being born. And then we saw that Jesus' rule as God's king was challenged by Satan as he was taken into the wilderness and tempted three times by Satan. But we saw that Jesus is God's victorious king. And then Jesus comes on the scene and he begins to preach. And he says the same as John, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And the crowds are gathering around him now as he preaches around the area of Galilee and as he does miracles and heals people. 
And in fact, we left Jesus a couple of weeks ago. Chapter 4, verse 25, with large crowds around him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan. And they're following Jesus, these large crowds. And so, have a look at me in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. What does Jesus do? Jesus saw the crowds and he in some way retreats. He goes up on a mountainside and he sits down. And his disciples come to him and he begins to teach them. Interestingly, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that's recorded for us, when we get to chapter 8, we find that Jesus comes down from the mountain and the large crowds are around him, following him again. And so it seems that Matthew has put this material together, this teaching block up on the mountain, away from some of the large crowds. There's still a crowd around Jesus. We see that in the Sermon on the Mount. But the primary aim for Jesus, as he teaches here, is his disciples. The disciples are the ones who've come to Jesus on this hillside above Lake Galilee, perhaps around the area of Capernaum. And these disciples are a wider group than just the 12 disciples. There are those, they are those who are listening to and learning from King Jesus. And I just want to make a brief point here, but a foundational point as we begin this Sermon on the Mount. But we see something just in these first two verses of what a disciple is. A disciple or a follower of Jesus is someone who listens to and learns from Jesus. Jesus here takes the position of a Jewish rabbi, a teacher, and he's sitting down as customarily they would. And then the disciples are coming round the rabbi to listen to him and listen to his teaching. And so in some ways, just these first two verses, as the Sermon on the Mount begins, ask a question of us. They, they ask you and me, are you listening to Jesus? Are you learning from him? If you were here with us last week or you caught up on uh, YouTube or online, uh, Pete Mayrick in our Future Forum was saying that if we want to grow as Christians and if we want our church to grow, we'll be sitting at Jesus' feet, so to speak, as these disciples were. Reading a bit of the Bible, thinking about a part of the Bible, seeking to apply that and pray that. And the research that he showed us is if we do that four times a week, it's likely that we'll be growing as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And indeed, that will spill into our church and our church will be growing. So are you listening to and learning from Jesus? That's what disciples do. So let's sit at Jesus' feet, so to speak, tonight and listen to him now as he begins this sermon teaching on what life is like in his kingdom as a disciple as we see what it is to be living in Jesus' kingdom. Now that's what these Beatitudes are doing in verses 3 to 12. They're describing life in God's kingdom. Now that, it is, now that God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, has broken into earth as Jesus has come. And this is all about living in God's kingdom. And that's given away in the structure of these poetic and pithy statements. You can probably see the structure there quite clearly, can't we? There's eight statements, actually, from verses 3 to 10, and then verses 11 and 12 expand on verse 10. And these eight statements all begin, don't they? Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And then some group of people describing a characteristic of what's it, what it's like to be in the kingdom of heaven. Four, and then describing a benefit of being a disciple of Jesus. And the overarching benefit is having the kingdom of heaven. It's there, isn't it, in verse 3 and verse 10 as bookends to these statements. Blessed are the poor in spirit, verse 3, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom that Jesus brings. And so in a sense, these statements, these beatitudes, are Jesus' kingdom manifesto. 
And who gets these benefits of his kingdom? Well, is it the religious elite? The Jews with status and power? You'd think it would be, wouldn't you? But here's where Jesus is turning things on their head as he begins to show how countercultural his kingdom is. Indeed, I think that's one of the outworkings of the Sermon on the Mount. It's a bit of a challenge against the religious elite that are beginning to be against him. So let's have a look at who is blessed. But actually, before we do, I thought it'd be helpful to just think about what that word blessed means. Um, It's about being in a relationship with God where his favor is upon you. I I think Aaron's blessing, Aaron the the priest in the Old Testament, his blessing in Numbers 6 is really helpful to understand what it is to be blessed by God. Uh, Moses is given the blessing by God that Aaron is to give. Uh, The Lord said to Moses, Numbers Numbers chapter 6, verse 22, Tell Aaron and his sons, they're the priests, this is how you're to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they, the priests, will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Blessing is about God's gracious favor being upon his people. So let's dig in and see who is blessed. First of all, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are blessed, those who see that they are in great need. Those who see Now before God, that they are spiritually poor, that they are spiritually bankrupt. The ones who are blessed and who have God's kingdom are those who see that they actually have nothing to offer God to earn his favor. See, if we think we can earn the kingdom of heaven, then Jesus teaches us here that we cannot do that. See, God is not interested in our merit. We have none. This comes out in a hymn that you might know, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. One of the verses says, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross, the cross of Jesus, I cling. And that's the song of the poor in spirit, isn't it? Is that your song? That you see that you're poor in spirit, that actually of yourself you have nothing to offer God. And you need his favor upon you as you come to him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This idea of being poor in spirit was actually there in our first reading from Isaiah chapter 61. I'm just going to read a couple of verses again. This uh, servant song in Isaiah 61 that Jesus actually brings out and says is about him. As Isaiah says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news. Who to? To the poor. That is the poor in spirit. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. And to provide for those who grieve in Zion. Which takes us, that idea of comforting those who mourn there in Isaiah 61 as well, to the next beatitude. In verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That is, blessed are those who mourn over their sin. Now that's the kind of mourning that's envisaged in Isaiah 61. Mourning over personal sin. Mourning over the sin of God's people. Mourning over the effects of sin in the world. But God's promise, back in Isaiah 61, was one of comfort. Comfort for those who mourn. And that promise 
is coming true in Jesus. As he begins to bring comfort now to those who mourn over their sin. Now we know the foretaste of that comfort now, don't we? As we know that Jesus has forgiven our sins. But there's still more comfort to come, isn't there? In a world spoilt by sin that is put right and restored when Jesus returns putting an end to sin and its effects. And so we do long for, don't we? And we do pray like the end of Revelation. Amen, come Lord Jesus, bring everything right, put it all right. So there'll no longer be any mourning and there'll be perfect comfort. And so, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Moving on, blessed are the meek, in verse 5, for they will inherit the earth. Who is it that has this blessing of the earth or the land to pick up? An Old Testament idea and the inheritance of the land of God's people and the great blessing of land that God promised to his people. Think of those promises to Abraham. Who is it that has this blessing? Those who trample over others to get to the top? The strong and the powerful? Well, no, in God's countercultural kingdom, it's the meek. Those who are gentle, those who are unpretentious, those who are humble. There's a constant theme in the Bible, isn't there? That it's the humble that God will lift up and the proud will be left empty. Blessed are those who are meek, are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. What is it that you really want? What do you hunger and thirst for? The next weekend away? The next holiday? The next deal? Whatever it is, what is it that you're hungry and thirsty for? Of course, perhaps for these disciples that Jesus was talking to, it could well have been more of a literal hunger and thirst for their next meal and maybe they weren't quite sure where it was coming from but Jesus says there's a greater hunger and thirst for his disciples than anything earthly blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness that is a right relationship with God this should be the greatest desire for you and me if we're living in Jesus's kingdom And the blessing of kingdom life is that that desire is filled through Jesus. They will be filled. We know, don't we, the righteousness that Jesus brings and that we now have. And that we will have when Jesus returns. And we'll be filled. The idea with that filled is we'll be stuffed as if you've had a good feed will be stuffed because Jesus gives us righteousness. And I just want to uh, pause for a moment as we're halfway through these Beatitudes and say that these characteristics that Jesus is teaching about life in his kingdom aren't discreet from one another. So it's not that some in the kingdom of heaven are poor in spirit, the group over here, others over there are mourning over sin, and another group are the meek, and then there's others that are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. What Jesus is describing are overall characteristics for all in the kingdom of heaven. Traits, if you like, that get layered on top of one another. There does seem to be a progression as we go through. Perhaps you could think of it as uh, Lego building blocks being built on top of one another. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and so Jesus here is building up a composite picture of life in the kingdom of heaven so let's add in the remaining lego bricks of this picture that Jesus paints here verse 7 blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy 
God's mercy is all about not giving us what we deserve, is it? We deserve his anger at our sin. And we, like him, are to be merciful. Not to earn God's mercy, but because we have received mercy for our sins, we will show mercy to those who sin against us. The church should be a wonderful place of mercy and forgiveness, shouldn't it? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I don't know if you've seen that uh, each of these characteristics of the life in Jesus' kingdom are coming from the blueprints for his people in the Old Testament of God's kingdom. Uh, Here it comes from Psalm 24. You might know this fairly well. Psalm 24 verse 3. Where Jesus talks about being pure in heart. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive, interesting the word, is blessing from the Lord. And vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him. Who seek your face. O God of Jacob. Well, that's the promise here, isn't it? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Picked up here, right from Psalm 24. But we can only be clean because of Jesus, can't we? Now, we can try and clean up the outside of ourselves so we all present nice on a Sunday at church and all those kind of things. Now, that was the big problem for the pious Jews in Jesus' day. That they were clean on the outside, but inside their hearts were full of evil. And they needed a pure heart. And only God can do that. But that's the good news of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus brings. That he, as the gospel goes on, will die so that we can have a clean heart and pure hands. And then we will see God. What a mind-blowing thing. Because of what Jesus has done for us, cleansing us of our sin, right to the core of our very being in our hearts, we will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, verse 9, for they will be called children of God or sons of God those in the kingdom of God will be like their heavenly father that's what we're seeing in a lot of these traits aren't we but verse 10 this final one Jesus says blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven See, Jesus makes it clear that living in his kingdom is going to clash with the world. And Jesus fleshes out, doesn't he, in verses 11 and 12, what this persecution will be like. Blessed are you when people insult you, when people persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, because of Jesus. And Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. Not because of the terrible persecution and insults and evil. But rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. That future sense. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Many Christians around the world, don't they? Know the reality of persecution much more sharply than we do. And it seems the temperature's rising here in Australia, isn't it? as the world turns more and more away from the kingdom of heaven. It reminded me as I was thinking about this of uh, the guy from Open Doors who came about 18 months ago, Gabriel. And uh, maybe you might want to have a look at some of the stories and pray for the persecuted church on the Open Doors website. You see, Jesus' kingdom is a countercultural kingdom. And so it will clash with the world. And we'll see more of this as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. 
It's not just countercultural now, Jesus' kingdom, but it was countercultural then as well. As Jesus, the King, came and brought in the kingdom of heaven, and it was countercultural to most of the expectations that the Jews had of what God's Messiah, God's King coming, would look like and would bring. Now just think of the idea of peacemakers there. Blessed are the peacemakers. And well, Jerusalem was uh, uh, overthrown by the Romans, wasn't it? The Romans were in charge at the time of Jesus. Is Jesus saying, be a peacemaker with them? How countercultural is that? But that's what Jesus is saying. And blessed are the peacemakers, for those are the ones who are children of God. And this message in these Beatitudes is countercultural today as well, isn't it? As we more think about blessing as being wealthy and happy and everything going well. And actually, the problem is, it's not so much that God's kingdom is upside down, is it that the world is upside down? And Jesus comes and brings in the kingdom of heaven to put the world the right way up again. God's way, as the kingdom of heaven breaks into this world. And so the Beatitudes are doing that in us. It's wonderful, isn't it, to think over them, to meditate on them. Uh, The Sermon on the Mount was, was written to be memorized. Here's a challenge for you this week. Maybe memorize the Beatitudes to get that into us so that then we live more and more as disciples of God's kingdom, that we would remember that we need to be poor in spirit, mourning our sin, and so on. You see, the question we need to ask as we listen to Jesus here is, am I blessed? Are you blessed? Do you know these blessings of the kingdom of heaven? So one thing I want to make clear here, that Jesus here isn't setting an entrance exam for the kingdom of heaven. So it's not that, uh, yeah, blessed are the poor in spirit. Okay, I'm, I'm blessed in that sense. And those who mourn over their sin, yep, tick. Blessed are the meek. Well, yeah, okay, probably on that. Blessed are those who hunger and on, merciful, pure, peacemakers. Blessed are those who persecuted. Tick, we don't really want to tick that, do we? It's not about an entrance exam. It's about being blessed because we're a disciple of Jesus. You see, all these blessings come through Jesus, don't they? And he will work to bring about his kingdom character in you if you're a disciple of his, if you're blessed. Transforming you through God's word and by his spirit to bring about this kingdom in you more and more. One writer put it very helpfully like this. As they said, the Beatitudes are neither a means of entering nor advancing in the kingdom. The Beatitudes are neither a means of entering nor advancing in the kingdom. What they are, are expressions of spirit-produced kingdom life. Expressions of spirit-produced kingdom life revealing to the entire world this countercultural world, that a transformation of creation is beginning in Jesus' disciples. That is why we are blessed. But let me say that if you're here tonight and listening to Jesus, but in some ways you're listening as the crowd, and you've not committed to be his disciple, then you are not blessed. You won't know these blessings of life, of comfort, of inheriting the earth, of being filled with his righteousness, of being shown mercy and on and on, if you're not one of Jesus' disciples. So if you're listening to Jesus today, but you've not come to him and committed to him, well, let me tell you, come to him today. And accept the gift he gives to his disciples, these blessings of the kingdom of heaven. Because we've seen here today, haven't we, a wonderful picture of blessing in this introduction in some ways to the Sermon on the Mount. 
the blessings of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus brings now that he is here. Are you blessed? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing that Jesus brings. Thank you that uh, you promised blessing to go out to all the nations, to Abraham, and now that is true in the Lord Jesus. Thank you that blessing comes to us here in Mossman tonight. If we will sit at Jesus' feet and commit ourselves to him as his disciples, to learn from him, to listen to him. So we ask that you would help us to do that. We pray this term as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, you'd help us to listen to Jesus and his countercultural message, the message of his kingdom, that we might be blessed as we live as your people, we pray. Amen. Thank you.